Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Weirdness The Men Return by Jack Vance Warm by Robert Sheckley Referent by Ray Bradbury World Edge by Jack Egan Touch the Sky by Alfred Koppel The Men Return by Jack Vance Originally published in Infinity, July 1957 Narrated by Tom Trussell The relict came furtively down the crag a shambling, gaunt creature with tortured eyes. He moved in a series of quick dashes, using panels of dark air for concealment, running behind each passing shadow, at times crawling on all fours, head low to the ground. Arriving at the final low outcrop of rock, he halted and peered across the plain. Far away rose low hills blurring into the sky, which was mottled and sallow like poor milk glass. The intervening plain spread like rotten velvet, black-green and wrinkled, streaked with ochre and rust. A fountain of liquid rock jetted high in the air, branched out into black coral. In the middle distance, a family of grey objects evolved with a sense of purposeful destiny. Spheres melted into pyramids, became domes, tufts of white spires, sky-piercing poles, then, as a final tour de force, tesseracts. The relict cared nothing for this. He needed food, and out on the plain were plants. They would suffice in lieu of anything better. They grew in the ground, or sometimes on a floating lump of water, or surrounding a core of hard black gas. There were dank black flaps of leaf, clumps of haggard thorn, pale green bulbs, stalks with leaves, and contorted flowers. There were no recognisable species, and the relict had no means of knowing if the leaves and tendrils he had eaten yesterday would poison him today. He tested the surface of the plain with his foot. The glassy surface though it likewise seemed a construction of red and grey-green pyramids, accepted his weight, then suddenly sucked at his leg. In a frenzy he tore himself free, jumped back, squatted on the temporarily solid rock. Hunger rasped at his stomach. He must eat. He contemplated the plain. Not too far away a pair of organisms played, sliding diving, dancing, striking flamboyant poses. Should they approach, he would try to kill one of them. They resembled men, and so should make a good meal. He waited. A long time, a short time, it might have been either. Duration had neither quantitative or qualitative reality. The sun had vanished, and there was no standard cycle or recurrence. Time was a word blank of meaning. Matters had not always been so. The relict retained a few tattered recollections of the old days, before system and logic had been rendered obsolete. Man had dominated earth by virtue of a single assumption, that an effect could be traced to a cause, itself the effect of a previous cause. Manipulation of this basic law yielded rich results. There seemed no need for any other tool or instrumentality. Man congratulated himself on his generalised structure. He could live on desert, on plain or ice, in forest or in city. Nature had not shaped him to a special environment. He was unaware of his vulnerability. Logic was the special environment. The brain 
was the special tool. Then came the terrible hour when Earth swam into a pocket of non-causality and all the ordered tensions of cause-effect dissolved. The special tool was useless. It had no purchase on reality. From the two billions of men, only a few survived. The mad. They were now the organisms, lords of the era, their discords so exactly equivalent to the vagaries of the land as to constitute a peculiar wild wisdom. Or perhaps the disorganised matter of the world, loose from the old organisation, was peculiarly sensitive to psychokinesis. A handful of others, the relicts, managed to exist, but only through a delicate set of circumstances. They were the ones most strongly charged with the old causal dynamic. It persisted sufficiently to control the metabolism of their bodies, but could extend no further. They were fast dying out, for sanity provided no leverage against the environment. Sometimes their own minds sputtered and jangled, and they would go raving and leaping out across the plain. The organisms observed, with neither surprise nor curiosity, how could surprise exist? The mad relict might pause by an organism and try to duplicate the creature's existence. The organism ate a mouthful of plant. So did the relict. The organism rubbed his feet with crushed water. So did the relict. Presently the relict would die of poison or rent bowels or skin lesions, while the organism relaxed in the dank black grass. Or the organism might seek to eat the relict, and the relict would run off in terror, unable to abide any part of the world, running, bounding, breasting the thick air, eyes wide, mouth open, calling and gasping until finally he floundered in a pool of black iron or blundered into a vacuum pocket to bat around like a fly in a bottle. The relicts now numbered very few. Finn, he who crouched on the rock overlooking the plain, lived with four others. Two of these were old men and soon would die. Finn, likewise, would die unless he found food. Out on the plain, one of the organisms, Alpha, sat down, caught a handful of air, a globe of blue liquid, a rock, kneaded them together, pulled the mixture like taffy, gave it a great heave. It uncoiled from his hand like rope. The relict crouched low, no telling what devilry would occur to the creature. He and all the rest of them, unpredictable. The relict valued their flesh as food, but they also would eat him if opportunity offered. In the competition he was at a great disadvantage. Their random acts baffled him. If, seeking to escape, he ran, the worst terror would begin. The direction he set his face was seldom the direction the varying frictions of the ground let him move. But the organisms were as random and uncommitted as the environment, and the double set of vagaries sometimes compounded, sometimes cancelled each other. In the latter case, the organisms might catch him. It was inexplicable. But then, what was not? The word explanation had no meaning. They were moving toward him. Had they seen him? He flattened himself against the sullen yellow rock. The two organisms paused not far away. He could hear their sounds and crouched, sick from conflicting pangs of hunger and fear. Alpha sank to his knees, lay flat on his back, arms and legs flung out at random, addressing the sky in a series of musical cries, sibilants, guttural groans. It was a personal language he had only now improvised, but Beta understood him well. "'A vision!' cried Alpha. "'I see past the sky. I see knots, spinning circles. 
they tighten into hard points, they will never come undone. Beta perched on a pyramid, glanced over this shoulder at the mottled sky. An intuition, chanted Alpha, a picture out of the other time. It is hard, merciless, inflexible. Beta poised on the pyramid, dove through the glassy surface, swam under Alpha, emerged, lay flat beside him. Observe the relict on the hillside. In his blood is the whole of the old race, the narrow men with minds like cracks. He has exuded the intuition. Clumsy thing, a blunderer, said Alpha. They are all dead, all of them, said Beta, although three or four remain. When past, present, and future are no more than ideas left over from another era, like boats on a dry lake, then the completion of a process can never be defined. Alpha said, This is the vision. I see the relics swarming the earth, then whisking off to nowhere like gnats in the wind. This is behind us. The organisms lay quiet, considering the vision. A rock, or perhaps a meteor, fell from the sky, struck into the surface of the pond. It left a circular hold which slowly closed. From another part of the pool a gout of fluid splashed into the air, floated away. Alpha spoke. Again! The intuition comes strong! There will be lights in the sky! The fever died in him. He hooked a finger into the air, hoisted himself to his feet. Beta lay quiet. Slugs, ants, flies, beetles were crawling on him, boring, breeding. Alpha knew that Beta could arise, shake off the insects, stride off. But Beta seemed to prefer passivity. That was well enough. He could produce another Beta should he choose or a dozen of him. Sometimes the world swarmed with organisms, all sorts, all colours, tall as steeples, short and squat as flower-pots. "'I feel a lack,' said Alpha. "'I will eat the relict.' He set forth, and sheer chance brought him near to the ledge of yellow rock. Finn the relict sprang to his feet in panic. Alpha tried to communicate so that Finn might pause while Alpha ate. But Finn had no grasp for the many-valued overtones of Alpha's voice. He seized a rock, hurled it at Alpha. The rock puffed into a cloud of dust, blew back into the relic's face. Alpha moved closer, extended his long arms. The relic kicked. His feet went out from under him, and he slid out on the plain. Alpha ambled complacently behind him. Finn began to crawl away. Alpha moved off to the right. One direction was as good as another. He collided with Beta, and began to eat Beta instead of the relict. The relict hesitated, then approached, and, joining Alpha, pushed chunks of pink flesh into his mouth. Alpha said to the relict, I was about to communicate an intuition to him whom we dine upon. I will speak to you. Finn could not understand Alpha's personal language. He ate as rapidly as possible. Alpha spoke on. There will be lights in the sky, the great lights. Finn rose to his feet and, warily watching Alpha, seized Beta's legs began to pull him toward the hill. Alpha watched with quizzical unconcern. It was hard work for the spindly relict. Sometimes Beta floated, sometimes he wafted off on the air, sometimes he adhered to the terrain. At last he sank into a knob of granite which froze around him. Finn tried to jerk Beta loose, and then to pry him up with a stick without success. He ran back and forth in an agony of indecision. Beta began to collapse, wither, 
like a jellyfish on hot sand. The relict abandoned the hulk. Too late, too late, food going to waste. The world was a hideous place of frustration. Temporarily, his belly was full. He'd started back up to the crag and presently found the camp where the four other relics waited. Two ancient males, two females. The females, Jisa and Reek, like Finn, had been out foraging. Jisa had brought in a slab of lichen, Reek a bit of nameless carrion. The old men, Bode and Taggart, sat quietly waiting either for food or for death. The women greeted Finn sullenly. Where is the food you went forth to find? I had a whole carcass, said Finn. I could not carry it. Bode had slyly stolen the slab of lichen and was cramming it into his mouth. It came alive, quivered and exuded a red ichor which was poison, and the old man died. Now there is food, said Finn. Let us eat. But the poison created a putrescence. The body seethed with blue foam, flowed away of its own energy. The women turned to look at the other old man, who said in a quavering voice, Eat me if you must, but why not choose Reek, who is younger than I? Reek, the younger of the women, gnawing on the bit of carrion, made no reply. Finn said hollowly, Why do we worry ourselves? Food is ever more difficult, and we are the last of all men. No, no, spoke Reek, not the last. We saw others on the green mound. That was long ago, said Jisa. Now they are surely dead. Perhaps they have found a source of food, suggested Reek. Finn rose to his feet, looked across the plain. Who knows? Perhaps there is a more pleasant land beyond the horizon. There is nothing anywhere but waste and evil creatures, snapped Jisa. What could be worse than here? Finn argued calmly. No one could find grounds for disagreement. Here is what I propose, said Finn. Notice this tall peak. Notice the layers of hard air. They bump into the peak. They bounce off. They float in and out and disappear past the edge of sight. Let us all climb this peak, and when a sufficiently large bank of air passes, we will throw ourselves on the top and allow it to carry us to the beautiful regions which may exist just out of sight. There was argument. The old man Taggart protested his feebleness. The women derided the possibility of the bountiful regions Finn envisioned. But presently, grumbling and arguing, they began to clamber up the pinnacle. It took a long time. The obsidian was soft as jelly, and Taggart several times professed himself at the limit of his endurance. But still they climbed, and at last reached the pinnacle. There was barely room to stand. They could see in all directions, far out over the landscape, till vision was lost in the watery grey. The women bickered and pointed in various directions, but there was small sign of happier territory. In one direction, blue-green hills shivered like bladders full of oil. In another direction lay a streak of black, a gorge or a lake of clay. In another direction were blue-green hills, the same they had seen in the first direction. Somehow there had been a shift. Below was the plain, gleaming like an iridescent beetle, here and there pocked with black velvet spots, overgrown with questionable vegetation. They saw organisms, a dozen shapes loitering by ponds, munching vegetable pods or small rocks or insects. There came Alpha. He moved slowly, still awed by his vision, ignoring the other organisms. Their play went on, but presently they stood quiet, sharing the oppression. 
on the obsidian peak, Finn caught hold of a passing filament of air, drew it in. Now, all on, and we sail away to the land of plenty. No, protested Jisa. There is no room, and who knows if it will fly in the right direction. Where is the right direction? asked Finn. Does anyone know? No one knew, but the women still refused to climb aboard the filament. Finn turned to Taggart. Here, old one, show these women how it is. Climb on. No, no, he cried. I fear the air. This is not for me. Climb on, old man. Then we follow. Wheezing and fearful, clenching his hands deep into the spongy mass, Taggart pulled himself out onto the air, spindly shanks hanging over into nothing. Now, spoke Finn, who next? The women still refused. You go then yourself, cried Jisa. And leave you, my last guarantee against hunger, aboard now. Now, the air is too small. Let the old one go, and we will follow on a larger. Very well, Finn released his grip. The air floated off over the plain, Taggart straddling and clutching for dear life. They watched him curiously. Observe, said Finn, how fast and easily moves the air, above the organisms, over all the slime and uncertainty. But the air itself was uncertain, and the old man's raft dissolved. Clutching at the departing wisps, Taggart sought to hold his cushion together. It fled from under him, and he fell. On the peak the three watched the spindly shape flap and twist on its way to earth far below. Now, Reek exclaimed vexatiously, we even have no more meat. None, said Jisa, except the visionary Finn himself. They surveyed Finn. Together they would more than outmatch him. Careful, cried Finn, I am the last of the men. You are my women, subject to my orders. They ignored him, muttering to each other, looking at him from the side of their faces. Careful, cried Finn, I will throw you both from this peak. That is what we plan for you, said Jisa. They advanced with sinister caution. Stop! I am the last man! We are better off without you. One moment! Look at the organisms! The women looked. The organisms stood in a knot, staring at the sky. Look at the sky! The women looked. The frosted glass was cracking, breaking, curling aside. The blue, the blue sky of old times! A terribly bright light burnt down, seared their eyes. The rays warmed their naked backs. The sun, they said in awed voices. The sun has come back to earth. The shrouded sky was gone. The sun rode proud and bright in a sea of blue. The ground below churned, cracked, heaved, solidified. They felt the obsidian harden under their feet. Its colour shifted to glossy black. The earth, the sun, the galaxy, had departed the region of freedom. The other time, with its restrictions and logic, was once more with them. This is old earth, cried Finn. We are men of old earth. The land is once again ours. And what of the organisms? If this is the earth of old, then let the organisms beware. The organisms stood on a low rise of ground beside a runnel of water that was rapidly becoming a river flowing out onto the plain. Alpha cried, Here is my intuition. It is exactly as I knew. The freedom is gone. The tightness, the constriction are back. How will we defeat it? asked another organism. Easily, said a third, each must fight a part of the battle. 
I plan to hurl myself at the sun and blot it from existence. And he crouched, threw himself into the air. He fell on his back and broke his neck. The fault, said Alpha, is in the air, because the air surrounds all things. Six organisms ran off in search of air and, stumbling into the river, drowned. In any event, said Alpha, I am hungry. He looked around for suitable food. He seized an insect which stung him. He dropped it. My hunger remains. He spied Finn and the two women descending from the crag. I will eat one of the relics, he said. Come, let us all eat. Three of them started off, as usual, in random directions. By chance, Alpha came face to face with Finn. He prepared to eat, but Finn picked up a rock. The rock remained a rock, hard, sharp, heavy. Finn swung it down, taking joy in the inertia. Alpha died with a crushed skull. One of the other organisms attempted to step across a crevasse twenty feet wide and disappeared into it. The other sat down, swallowed rocks to assuage his hunger, and presently went into convulsions. Finn pointed here and there around the fresh new land. In that quarter, a new city, like that of the legends. Over here, the farms, the cattle. We have none of these, protested Jisa. No, said Finn, not now. But once more the sun rises and sets, once more rock has weight and air has none, once more water falls as rain and flows to the sea. He stepped forward over the fallen organism. Let us make plans. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Warm by Robert Sheckley Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, June 1953 Narrated by Tom Trusser It was a joyous journey Anders set out on to reach his goal. But look where he wound up. Anders lay on his bed, fully dressed except for his shoes and black bow tie, contemplating, with a certain uneasiness, the evening before him. In twenty minutes he would pick up Judy at her apartment, and that was the uneasy part of it. He had realised, only seconds ago, that he was in love with her. Well, he'd tell her. The evening would be memorable. He would propose, there would be kisses, and the seal of acceptance would figuratively speaking, be stamped across his forehead. Not too pleasant an outlook, he decided. It really would be much more comfortable not to be in love. What had done it? A look, a touch, a thought? It didn't take much, he knew, and stretched his arms for a thorough yawn. Help me, a voice said. His muscles spasmed, cutting off the yawn in mid-moment. He sat upright on the bed, then grinned and lay back again. "'You must help me!' the voice insisted. Anders sat up, reached for a polished shoe and fitted it on, giving his full attention to the tying of the laces. "'Can you hear me?' the voice asked. "'You can, can't you?' That did it. "'Yes, I can hear you,' Anders said, still in a high good humour. Don't tell me you're my guilty subconscious, attacking me for a childhood trauma I never bothered to resolve. I suppose you want me to join a monastery. I don't know what you're talking about, the voice said. I'm no one's subconscious. I'm me. Will you help me? Anders believed in voices as much as anyone. That is, he didn't believe in them at all, until he heard them. Swiftly he catalogued the possibilities. Schizophrenia was the best answer, of course and one in which his colleagues would concur. But Anders had a lamentable confidence in his own sanity. In which case, 
Who are you? he asked. I don't know, the voice answered. Anders realized that the voice was speaking within his own mind, very suspicious. You don't know who you are, Anders stated. Very well. Where are you? I don't know that either, the voice paused and went on. Look, I know how ridiculous this must sound. Believe me, I'm in some sort of limbo. I don't know how I got here or who I am, but I want desperately to get out. Will you help me? Still fighting the idea of a voice speaking within his head, Anders knew that his next decision was vital. He had to accept or reject his own sanity. He accepted it. All right, Anders said, lacing the other shoe. I'll grant that you're a person in trouble and that you're in some sort of telepathic contact with me. Is there anything else you can tell me? I'm afraid not, the voice said with infinite sadness. You'll have to find out for yourself. Can you contact anyone else? No. Then how can you talk with me? I don't know. Anders walked to his bureau mirror and adjusted his black bow tie, whistling softly under his breath. Having just discovered that he was in love, he wasn't going to let a little thing like a voice in his mind disturb him. I really don't see how I can be of any help, Anders said, brushing a bit of lint from his jacket. You don't know where you are, and there don't seem to be any distinguishing landmarks. How am I to find you? He turned and looked around the room to see if he had forgotten anything. I'll know when you're close, the voice said. You were warm just then. Just then, all he had done was look around the room. He did so again, turning his head slowly. Then it happened. The room, from one angle, looked different. It was suddenly a mixture of muddled colours instead of the carefully blended pastel shades he had selected. The lines of wall, floor and ceiling were strangely off proportion, zigzag, unrelated. Then everything went back to normal. You were very warm, the voice said. It's a question of seeing things correctly. Anders resisted the urge to scratch his head for fear of disarranging his carefully combed hair. What he had seen wasn't so strange. Everyone sees one or two things in his life that make him doubt his normality, doubt sanity, doubt his very existence. For a moment the orderly universe is disarranged and the fabric of belief is ripped. But the moment passes. Anders remembered once, as a boy, awakening in his room in the middle of the night, how strange everything had looked. Chairs, table, all out of proportion, swollen in the dark, the ceiling pressing down as in a dream. But that had also passed. Well, old man, he said, if I get warm again, let me know. I will, the voice in his head whispered. I'm sure you'll find me. I'm glad you're so sure, Anders said gaily, switching off the lights and left. Lovely and smiling, Judy greeted him at the door. Looking at her, Anders sensed her knowledge of the moment. Had she felt the change in him, or predicted it? Or was love making him grin like an idiot? Would you like a before-party drink? she asked. He nodded, and she led him across the room to the improbable green and yellow couch. Sitting down, Anders decided he would tell her when she came back with a drink. No use in putting off the fatal moment. A lemming in love, he told himself. You're getting warm again, the voice said. He had almost forgotten his invisible friend, or fiend, as the case would, what could well be. What would Judy say if she knew he was hearing voices? Little things like that, he reminded himself, often break up the best of romances. Here, she said, handing him a drink. Still smiling, he noticed. The number two smile, to a prospective suitor, provocative and understanding. It had been preceded in their relationship by the number one nice girl smile, the don't misunderstand me smile, to be worn on all occasions until the correct words have been mumbled. That's right, the voice said. It's in how you look at things. Look at what? Anders glanced at Judy, annoyed at his thoughts. If he was going to play the lover, let him play it. 
Even through the astigmatic haze of love, he was able to appreciate her blue-grey eyes, her fine skin, if one overlooked a tiny blemish on the left temple, her lips, slightly reshaped by lipstick. "'How did your classes go today?' she asked. "'Well, of course she'd ask that,' Anders thought. "'Love is marking time.' "'All right,' he said, teaching psychology to young apes. "'Oh, come now!' "'Warma!' the voice said. "'What's the matter with me?' Anders wondered. "'He really is a lovely girl. "'The gestalt that is Judy, a pattern of thoughts, expressions, movements, "'making up the girl I... I what? Love?' Anders shifted his long body uncertainly on the couch. He didn't quite understand how this train of thought had begun. It annoyed him. The analytical young instructor was better off in the classroom. Couldn't science wait until nine ten in the morning? "'I was thinking about you today,' Judy said, and Anders knew that she had sensed the change in his mood. "'Do you see?' the voice asked him. "'You're getting much better at it.' I don't see anything, Anders thought, but the voice was right. It was as though he had a clear line of inspection into Judy's mind. Her feelings were nakedly apparent to him, as meaningless as his room had been in that flash of undistorted thought. I really was thinking about you, she repeated. Now look, the voice said. Anders, watching the expressions on Judy's face, felt the strangeness descend on him was back in the nightmare perception of that moment in his room. This time it was as though he were watching a machine in a laboratory. The object of this operation was the evocation and preservation of a particular mood. The machine goes through a searching process, invoking trains of ideas to achieve the desired ends. "'Oh, were you?' he asked, amazed at his new perspective. "'Yes. I wondered what you were doing at noon.' The reactive machine opposite him on the couch said, expanding its shapely chest slightly. Good, the voice said, commending him for his perception. Dreaming of you, of course, he said to the flesh-clad skeleton behind the total gestalt Judy. The flesh machine rearranged its limbs, widened its mouth to denote pleasure. The mechanism searched through a complex of fears, hopes, worries, through half-remembrances of analogous situations, analogous solutions. And this was what he loved. Anders saw too clearly and hated himself for seeing. Through his new nightmare perception, the absurdity of the entire room struck him. "'Were you really?' the articulating skeleton asked him. "'You're coming closer,' the voice whispered. "'To what? The personality?' There was no such thing. There was no true cohesion, no depth, nothing except a web of surface reactions stretched across automatic visceral movements. He was coming closer to the truth. Sure, he said sourly. The machine stirred, searching for a response. Anders felt a quick tremor of fear at the sheer alien quality of his viewpoint. His sense of formalism had been sloughed off, his agreed-upon reactions bypassed. What would be revealed next? He was seeing clearly, he realised, as perhaps no man had ever seen before. It was an oddly exhilarating thought. But could he still return to normality? "'Can I get you a drink?' the reaction machine asked. At that moment, Anders was as thoroughly out of love as a man could be. Viewing one's intended as a depersonalized, sexless piece of machinery is not especially conductive to love, but it is quite stimulating intellectually. Anders didn't want normality. A curtain was being raised, and he wanted to see behind it. What was it some Russian scientist, Uspensky, wasn't it, had said? Think in other categories. That was what he was doing and would continue to do. Goodbye, he said suddenly. The machine watched him, open mouthed as he walked out the door. Delayed circuit reactions kept its silence until it heard the elevator door close. You were very warm in there, the voice within his head whispered once he was on the street, but you still don't understand everything. Tell me then, 
Anders said, marvelling a little at his equanimity. In an hour he had bridged the gap to a completely different viewpoint, yet it seemed perfectly natural. "'I can't,' the voice said. "'You must find it yourself.' "'Well, let's see now,' Anders began. He looked around at the masses of masonry, the convention of streets cutting through architectural piles. "'Human life,' he said, "'is a series of conventions. When you look at a girl, you're supposed to see a pattern, not the underlying formlessness.' "'That's true,' the voice agreed, but with a shade of doubt. Basically, there is no form. Man produces gestalts, and cuts form out of the plethora of nothingness. It's like looking at a set of lines and saying that they represent a figure. We look at a mass of material, extract it from the background, and say it's a man. But in truth, there is no such thing. There are only the humanizing features that we, myopically, attach to it. Matter is conjoined, a matter of viewpoint. "'You're not seeing it now,' said the voice. "'Damn it!' Anders said. "'You were certain that it was on the track of something big, "'perhaps something ultimate. "'Everyone's had the experience. "'At some time in his life, "'everyone looks at a familiar object "'and can't make any sense out of it. "'Momentarily, the gestalt fails, "'but the true moment of sight passes. "'The mind reverts to the superimposed pattern. "'A normalcy continues.' The voice was silent, Anders walked on through the Gestalt city. "'There's something else, isn't there?' Anders asked. "'Yes.' "'What could that be?' he asked himself. Through clearing eyes, Anders looked at the formality he had called his world. He wondered momentarily if he would have come to this if the voice hadn't guided him. "'Yes,' he decided after a few moments. "'It was inevitable.' But who was the voice, and what had he left out? Let's see what a party looks like now, he said to the voice. The party was a masquerade. The guests were all wearing their faces. To Anders, their motives, individually and collectively, were painfully apparent. Then his vision began to clear further. He saw that the people weren't truly individual. They were discontinuous lumps of flesh sharing a common vocabulary, yet not even truly discontinuous. The lumps of flesh were a part of the decoration of the room and almost indistinguishable from it. They were one with the lights which lent their tiny vision. They were joined to the sounds they made, a few feeble tones out of the great possibility of sound. They blended into the walls. The kaleidoscopic view came so fast that Anders had trouble sorting his new impressions. He knew now that these people existed only as patterns, on the same basis as the sounds they made and the things they thought they saw. Gestalts shifted out of the vast, unbearable real world. "'Where's Judy?' a discontinuous lump of flesh asked him. This particular lump possessed enough nervous mannerisms to convince the other lumps of his reality. He wore a loud tie as further evidence. She is sick, Anders said. The flesh quivered into an instant sympathy. Lines of formal mirth shifted to formal woe. Hope it isn't anything serious, the vocal flesh remarked. You're warmer, the voice said to Anders. Anders looked at the object in front of him. "'She hasn't long to live,' he stated. The flesh quivered, stomach and intestines contracted in sympathetic fear, eyes distended, mouth quivered. The loud tie remained the same. "'My God, you don't mean it!' "'What are you?' Anders asked quietly. "'What do you mean?' the indignant flesh attached to the tie demanded. Serene within its reality, it gaped at Anders, its mouth twitched, undeniable proof that it was real and sufficient. "'You're drunk!' it sneered. Anders laughed and left the party. "'There is still something you don't know,' the voice said. "'But you are hot. I could feel you near me.' "'What are you?' Anders asked again. "'I don't know,' the voice admitted. "'I'm a person.' I am I. I am trapped. 
So are we all, Anders said. He walked on asphalt, surrounded by heaps of concrete, silicates, aluminium and iron alloys. Shapeless, meaningless heaps that made up the Gestalt city. And then there were the imaginary lines of demarcation dividing city from city, the artificial boundaries of water and land. All ridiculous. Give me a dime for some coffee, mister, something asked, a thing indistinguishable from any other thing. Old Bishop Barclay would give a non-existent dime to your non-existent presence, Anzas said gaily. I'm really in a bad way, the voice whined, and Anders perceived that it was no more than a series of modulated vibrations. Yes, go on, the voice commanded. If you could spare me a quarter, the vibrations said with a deep pretense at meaning. No, what was there behind the senseless patterns? Flesh, mass. What was that? All made up of atoms. I'm really hungry, the intricately arranged atoms muttered. All atoms, conjoined. There were no true separations between atom and appen. Flesh was stone, stone was light. Anders looked at the masses of atoms that were pretending to solidity, meaning and reason. Can't you help me? a clump of atoms asked. But the clump was identical with all the other atoms. Once you ignored the superimposed patterns, you could see the atoms were random, scattered. I don't believe in you, Anders said. The pile of atoms was gone. Yes, the voice cried. Yes! I don't believe in any of it, Anders said. After all, what was an atom? Go on, the voice shouted. You're hot, go on! What was an atom? An empty space surrounded by an empty space. Absurd! Then it's all false, Anders said, and he was alone under the stars. That's right, the voice within his head screamed. Nothing! But stars, Anders thought. How can one believe? The stars disappeared. Anders was in a grey nothingness, a void. There was nothing around him except shapeless grey. Where was the voice? Gone. Anders perceived the delusion behind the greyness, and then there was nothing at all. Complete nothingness, and himself within it. Where was he? What did it mean? Anders's mind tried to add it up. Impossible. That couldn't be true. Again, the score was tabulated, but Anders's mind couldn't accept the total. In desperation, the overloaded mind erased the figures, eradicated the knowledge, erased itself. Where am I? In nothingness, alone, trapped. Who am I? A voice. The voice of Anders searched the nothingness, shouted, Is there anyone here? No answer. But there was someone. All directions were the same, yet moving along one, he could make contact with someone. The voice of Anders reached back to someone who could save him, perhaps. Save me, the voice said to Anders, lying fully dressed on his bed, except for his shoe and black bow tie. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Referent by Ray Bradbury Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, October 1948 Narrated by Tom Tudusser Robbie Morrison fidgeted Walking in the tropical heat, he heard the wet thunder of waves on the shore. There was a green silence on Orthopedic Island. It was the year 1997, but Robbie did not care. All around him was the garden where he prowled, all ten years of him. This was meditation hour. Beyond the garden wall to the north were the high IQ cubicles, where he and the other boys slept in special beds. 
with morning they popped up like bottle corks, dashed into showers, gulped food, and were sucked down vacuum tubes half across the island to semantics school. Then to physiology. After physiology he was blown back underground and released through a seal in the great garden wall to spend this silly hour of meditative frustration, as prescribed by the island psychologists. Robbie had his opinion of it. Damned silly! Today he was in furious rebellion. He glared at the sea, wishing he had the sea's freedom to come and go. His eyes were dark, his cheeks flushed, his small hands twitched nervously. Somewhere in the garden a chime vibrated softly. Fifteen more minutes of meditation, huh? and then to the robot commissary to stuff his dead hunger as taxidermists stuff birds. And after the scientifically pure lunch, through the tube again to sociology. Of course, late in the warm green afternoon, games would be played in the main garden, games that some tremble-brained psychologists had evolved from a nightmare-haunted sleep. This was the future. You must live, my lad, as the people of the past, of the year 1920, 1930, and 1942 predicted you would live. Everything fresh, brisk, sanitary, too, too fresh. No nasty old parents about to give one complexes. Everything controlled, dear boy. Robbie should have been in a perfect mood for something unique. He wasn't. When the star fell from the sky a moment later, he was only more irritated. The star was a spheroid. It crashed and rolled to a stop on the hot green grass. A small door popped open in it. Faintly, this incident recalled a dream to the child, a dream which with superior stubbornness he had refused to record in his Freud book this morning. The dream thought was in his mind as the exact instant that the star door popped wide and some thing emerged. Some thing. Young eyes seeing an object for the first time have to make a familiar thing of it. Robbie didn't know what this thing was stepping from the sphere. So, scowling, Robbie thought of what it most resembled. Instantly, the something became a certain thing. Warm air ran cold. Light flickered, form changed, melted, shifted as the thing evolved into certainty. Startled, a tall, thin, pale man stood beside the metal star. The man had pink, terrified eyes. He trembled. "'Oh, I know you,' Robbie was disappointed. "'You're only the Sandman.' "'Sandman?' The stranger quivered like heat rising from boiling metal. His shaking hands went wildly up to touch his long coppery hair as if he'd never seen or felt it before. The Sandman gazed in horror at his own hands, legs, feet, body, as if they were all new. Sandman? The word was difficult. Talking was new to him also. He seemed about to flee, but something stopped him. Yeah, said Robbie. I dream about you every night. Oh, I know what you think. Semantically, our teachers say that ghosts, goblins and fairies and sandmans are labels, only names for which there aren't any actual reference, no actual objects or things. But to heck with that. We kids know more than teachers about it. You being here proves the teachers wrong. There are sandmen, after all, aren't there? Don't give me a label, cried the sandman suddenly. He seemed to understand now. For some reason he was unutterably frightened. He kept pinching, tugging, and feeling his own long new body, as if it was a thing of terror. Don't name me! Don't label me! Huh? I'm a referent, screamed the sandman. I'm not a label. I'm just a referent. Let me go. Robbie's little green cat eyes slitted. Say... He put his hand on his hips. Did Mr. Grill send you? I bet he did. I bet this is another of those psychological tests. 
Robbie flushed with dark anger. Always and forever they were at him. His sorted his games, food, education, took away his friends and his mother, his father, and now played tricks on him. I'm not from Mr. Grill, pleaded the Sandman. Listen, before anyone else comes and sees me this way and makes it worse. Robbie kicked violently. The Sandman danced back, gasping. Listen, I'm not human, you are, he shouted. Thought has moulded the flesh of all you here on this world. You're all dictated to by labels. But I, I am a pure reverent. Liar! More kicking from Robbie. The Sandman gibbered with frustration. The truth, child, centuries of thought have moulded your atoms to your present form. If you could undermine and destroy that belief, the beliefs of your friends, teachers, and parents, you could change form, be a pure referent too, like freedom, liberty, humanity, or time, space, and justice. Grill has sent you. He's always pestering me. No, no, atoms are malleable. You're accepted certain labels on earth, called man, woman, child, head, hands, fingers, feet. You've changed from anything into something. Leave me alone, protested Robbie. I have a test today. I have to think. He sat on a rock, hands over his ears. The Sandman glanced fearfully about, as if expecting disaster. Standing over Robbie, he was beginning to tremble and cry. Earth could have been a thousand other ways. Thought, using labels, went around tidying up a disordered cosmos. Now no one bothers trying to think things into other different shapes. Go away, sniffed Robbie. I landed near you, not suspecting the danger. I was curious. Inside my spheroid spaceship, thoughts cannot change my shape. I've travelled from world to world over the centuries and never been trapped like this. Tears sprang down his face. And now, by the gods, you've labelled me, caught me, imprisoned me with thought. This sandman idea, horrible. I can't fight it. I can't change back. And if I can't change back, I'll never fit into my ship again. I'm much too large. I'll be stranded on earth forever. Release me! The Sandman screamed, wept, shouted. Robbie's mind wandered. He debated quietly with himself. What did he want, most of all? Escape from this island. Silly, they always caught you. What then? Games, maybe. Like to play regular games, minus psycho-supervision. Yeah, that'd be nice. Kick the can or spin the bottle. Or even just a rubber ball to bounce on the garden wall and catch. All to himself. Yeah. A red ball. The Sandman cried, Don't! Silence. A red rubber ball bounced on the ground. Up and down bounced the red rubber ball. Hey! It took Robbie a moment to realise the ball was there. Where'd this come from? He hurled it against the wall, caught it. Gee! He didn't notice the absence of a certain stranger who had been shouting at him a few moments before. The Sandman was gong. Way off in the hot distance of the garden a boinging noise sounded. A cylinder was rushing up the tube to the wall's circular door. The door peeled open with a faint hiss. Footsteps rustled measuredly along the path. Mr. Grill stepped through a lush frame of tiger lilies. "'Morning, Robbie!' "'Oh!' Mr. Grill stopped. His chubby pink face looked as if it had been kicked. "'What have you there, boy?' he cried. Robbie bounced the object against the wall. "'This? A rubber ball?' "'Eh?' Grill's small blue eyes blinked, narrowing. Then he relaxed. "'Why, of course. For a moment I thought I saw... Uh, uh. Robbie bounced the ball some more. Grill cleared his throat. Lunchtime, meditation hour is over, and I'm not certain that Minister Locke would enjoy your playing unorthodox games. Robbie swore under his breath. Oh well then, go on, play, I won't tattle. Mr. Grill was in a generous mood. 
Don't feel like playing, Robbie sulked, shoving his sandal tip into the dirt. Teachers spoiled everything. You couldn't vomit without permission. Grill tried to interest the boy. If you come to lunch now, I'll let you televise your mother in Chicago afterwards. Time limit, two minutes, ten seconds, no more, no less, was Robbie's acid reply. I gather you don't approve of things, boy. I'll run away some day, wait and see. Tut, lad, we'll always bring you back, you know. I didn't ask to be brought here in the first place, Robbie bit his lip, staring at his new red rubber ball. He thought he had seen it, kind of, sort of, well, move, funny. He held the ball in his hand. The ball shivered. Grill patted his shoulder. Your mother is neurotic. Bad environment. You're better off here on the island. You have a high IQ and it is an honour for you to be here with the other little boy geniuses. You're unstable and unhappy and we're trying to change that. Eventually you'll be the exact antithesis of your mother. I love mother. You like her? corrected Grill quietly. "'I like mother,' replied Robbie, disquieted. The red ball twitched in his hand, without his touching it. He looked at it with wonder. "'You'll only make it harder for yourself if you love her,' said Grill. "'You goddamn silly,' said Robbie. Grill stiffened. "'Don't swear. Besides, you don't really mean God, and you don't mean damn.' There's very little of either in the world. Semantics, Book 7, page 418, Labels and Reference. Now I remember, shouted Robbie, looking around. There was a sandman here just now, and he said, Come along, said Mr. Grill. Lunchtime. Commissary food emerged from robot servants on extension springs. Robbie accepted the ovoid plate and milk globe silently. Where he had hidden it, the red rubber ball pulsed and beat like a heart under his belt. A gong rang. He gulped food swiftly. The tumble for the tube began. They were blown like feathers across the island to sociology and then, later in the afternoon, back again for games. Hours passed. Robbie slipped away to the garden to be alone. Hatred for this insane, never-stopping routine for his teachers and his fellow students flashed through him in a scouring torrent. He sat alone and thought of his mother, a long great distance away. In great detail he recalled how she looked and what she smelled like, and how her voice was, and how she touched and held and kissed him. He put his head down into his hands and began to fill the palms of his hands with small tears. He dropped the red rubber ball. He didn't care. He only thought of his mother. The jungle shivered. Something shifted. Quickly. A woman ran through the deep grass. She ran away from Robbie, slipped, cried out, and fell. Something glittered in the sunlight. The woman was running toward that silvery glittering thing, the spheroid, the silver starship. And where had she come from? And why was she running toward the sphere? And why had she fallen as she looked up? She didn't seem to be able to get up. Robbie leapt from his rock, gave chase. He caught up with and stood over the woman. Mother! he screamed. Her face shivered and changed like melting snow, then took on a hard cast, became definite and handsome. I'm not your mother, she said. He didn't hear. He only heard his own breath moving over his shaking lips. He was so weak with shock he could hardly stand. He put out his hands to water. "'Can't you understand?' Her face was cold. "'I'm not your mother. Don't label me. Why must I have a name? Let me get back to my ship. I'll kill you if you don't.' Robbie swayed. "'Mother, don't you know me? I'm Robbie, your son.' He wanted only to cry against her tell her of the long months of imprisonment. Please, please, mum, please remember me. Sobbing, he moved forward and fell against her. Her fingers tightened on his throat. She strangled him. He tried to scream. The scream was caught, 
pressed back into his bursting lungs, he flailed his legs. Deep in a cold, hard, angry face, Robbie found the answer even as her fingers tightened and thing grew dark. Deep in her face, he saw a vestige of the Sandman. The Sandman, the star falling on the summer sky, the silver sphere, the ship toward which this woman had been running, the disappearance of the Sandman, the appearance of the red ball, the vanishing of the red ball, and now the appearance of his mother. It all fitted. Matrices, mould, thought habits, patterns, matter, the history of man, his body, all things in the universe. She was killing him. She would make him stop thinking. Then she would be free. Thoughts, darkness. He could barely move now. Weak, weak. He had thought it was his mother. It wasn't. Nevertheless, it was killing him. What if Robbie thought something else? Try, anyway, try it. He kicked. In the wild darkness he thought, hard, hard. With a wail, his mother withered before him. He concentrated. Her fingers dwindled from his throat. Her bright face crumbled. Her body shrank to another size. He was free. He rose up, gasping. Through the jungle he saw the silver sphere lying in the sun. He staggered toward it, then cried out with the sharp thrill of the plan that formed in his mind. He laughed triumphantly. He stared once more at it. What was left of the woman changed before his eyes like melting wax. He reshaped it into something new. The garden wall trembled. A vacuum cylinder was hissing up through the tube. Mr. Grill was coming. Robbie would have to hurry or his plan would be ruined. Robbie ran to the spheroid, peered in. Simple controls. Just enough room for his small body, if the plan worked. It had to work. It would work. The garden trembled with the approaching thunder of the cylinder. Robbie laughed. To hell with Mr. Grill. To hell with this island. He thrust himself into the ship. There was much he could learn. It would come in time. He was just on the skirt of knowledge now, but that little knowledge had saved his life, and now it would do even more. A voice cried out behind him. A familiar voice. So familiar that it had made Robbie shudder. Robbie heard small boy feet crash the underbrush. Small feet on a small body. A small voice pleading. Robbie grasped the ship's controls. Escape, complete and unsuspected. Simple, wonderful. Grill would never know. The sphere door slammed, motion. The star, Robbie inside, rose on the summer sky. Mr. Grill stepped out of the seal in the garden wall. He looked around for Robbie. Sunlight struck him warmly in the face as he hurried down the path. There, there was Robbie. In the clearing ahead of him, little Robbie Morrison staring at the sky, making fists, crying out to nobody. At least Grill could see nobody about. Hello, Robbie, called Grill. The boy jerked at the sound. He wavered in colour, density and quality. Grill blinked, decided it was only the sun. I'm not Robbie, cried the child. Robbie escaped. He left me to take his place, to fool you so you wouldn't hunt for him. He fooled me too, screamed the child, nastily, sobbing. No, no, don't look at me. Don't think that I'm Robbie. You'll make it worse. You came expecting to find him, and you found me, and made me into Robbie. You're moulding me, and I'll never, never, never change now. Oh, God! Come now, Robbie. Robbie'll never come back. I'll always be him. I was a rubber ball, a woman, a sandman, but believe me, I'm only malleable atoms, that's all. Let me go. Grill backed up slowly. His smile was sick. I'm a referent. I'm not a label, cried the child. Yes, yes, I understand. Now, now, Robbie, Robbie, 
You just wait right there, right there now, while I, while I, while I call the psycho ward. Moments later, a corps of assistants ran through the garden. God damn you all, screamed the child, kicking. Damn you! Tut, declared Grill quietly, as they forced the child into the vac cylinder. You're using a label for which there is no referent. The cylinder sucked them away. A star blinked on the summer sky and vanished. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. World Edge by Jack Egan Originally published in Amazing Stories, November 1962 Narrated by Tom Trissen. Harvey Crane was lying flat on his back, though how he had gotten there he was still trying to figure out. Above him he could see the flat pink half-sphere of the sky. Now that bothered him. He squinted up at it for several more minutes before deciding it was the colour that was wrong somehow. Harvey hunched up into a sitting position, yawned widely, and gazed around. Thirty yards to his left, a stand of blue and yellow trees, triangular in shape, effectively blocked the horizon. In front of him, a tapered cylinder, balanced gracefully on his nose, performed the same function. To his right, there was no horizon. God damn, said Harvey Crane. He crawled the ten feet or so to the edge of the world, and looked down. The all-pervading rosiness swirled below. Harvey tightened his belt to hold his stomach in place, inched far back from the edge, and stood shakily up. It was then that he noticed the girl. She stood with hands on hips, critically appraising the ship. Aha! The ship! That's what it is, Harvey thought triumphantly. I see you're trying to land it again, the girl said dryly. Again? Harvey wondered, but said nothing. She walked over to the ship, lifted the gargantuan structure by a wingtip, and scowled back at him. Well, don't just stand there like an idiot. Come give me a hand. He was surprised at the ease with which they handled the rocket. They soon had it righted, and the girl stood back and gazed at it worryingly. There! she said. It sounded final. A look of vague annoyance crossed her pretty features. She shook her long brown hair into place, flicked an imaginary speck of dust off her spotless white trousers, rolled the sleeves of her blouse up, and erased the ship. Hey! shouted Harvey wildly. You can't do that! He stared in dumb amazement at the fading afterimage of the ship. Beyond it, the long upward slope of the yellow, grassy hill was crowned by a huge castle. "'Don't be silly, Harvey dear. Come on, it's playtime!' He followed her, for some reason, up the slope to the palace. Playtime, Harvey learned, consisted of a pleasant swim in the purple waters of the palace moat, followed by a delicious feast of some sort of orange fruit faintly resembling wax-covered ladybugs. They— he and the girl, and a pet animal with a disturbing tendency to change shape every three seconds, were seated in a rather large floral garden. There was a formal one somewhere nearby, Harvey learned, gazing. That is to say, the girl was gazing at the garden, the animal at Harvey, and Harvey at her. It must have been a pleasant experience all around, for they started laughing after a few minutes. Say, Harvey said, standing, I don't have the faintest idea who I am, where I am, or why, but who are you? She bit her lip and said with forced gaiety, My goodness, Harvey, don't you remember? No, I suppose you don't. Well, I'm Dana. Tell me, Harvey, she walked over to him and looked into his eyes, how much do you remember? Harvey stopped smiling, 
frowned, rubbed a hand through his black hair. Not much, he admitted, staring out the palace window. I keep having the feeling that if I try hard enough— But I'm not sure I want to remember, he finished, puzzled. Now, Harvey, Dana laughed and put her arms around him. You're here now, and that's all that matters. You've always been here. Harvey looked down at her fondly. He pronounced, Now you have aroused my curiosity. He kissed her, felt an imperious snap at his pant leg, and turned to find an amazing likeness of a dragon turning a burning gaze at his exposed calf. Hey! he shouted, and jumped. Timothy! Dana shouted, and the dragon reverted to her pet animal. She turned back to Harvey. I'm so sorry, Harvey. Timothy is really very fond of you. He has an odd way of showing it, Harley growled. The pinkness of the outer world suddenly changed to a deep aquamarine. Oh, dear, sighed Dana. Night already, and I haven't made up the bed. I suppose we can sleep on the cot tonight, she said tentatively. We? Oui? Oh, I forgot. You just got her today, didn't you? she said absently, a little rankled. Well, you can have the cot tonight, Harvey. I, we have so much to do the rest of our lives. Harvey felt so suddenly overcome with weariness, he didn't think to ask her just what it was they had so much of. He followed her docilely down a blue-lighted corridor and out onto a small balcony. A low cot, lined with silk and complete with canopy, reposed in the exact centre of the porch. He turned to say good night to Dana and found her already gone. The little changeling sat panting in her place, its multimorphic form vibrating slightly. Harvey grinned down at his angry dwarfish stare. Jealous, eh? he said. The bathroom was off to the right side of the balcony. Harvey found he needed nothing but a drink of water. It was purple. His chin showed no signs of erupting in its usual forest of thick, dark hairs. He swore good-naturedly at this. It had been his intention to grow a beard, put his razor away, and undressed for bed. A pair of loose, soft pyjamas of neutral colour lay across the cot. They fit him. The aqua sky showed thousands of vary-shaped blobs that whirled crazily overhead. He at first mistook them for clouds. Gradually it became apparent that they were moons, each a different colour. Somehow the glinting gold one seemed familiar to him. Finally he gave up trying to chase down a forgotten memory, and looked past them to the stars. Now, what were stars? Harvey stared at the powder sprinkled across the sky. He must know what they are. He knew what they were called, didn't he? Or had he just imagined the name, made it up himself? Grip, the changeling said softly. Harvey switched his gaze from the sky to the outstretched form of a bear rug lying on the floor beside the cot. Grip! Hmm. The changeling's body was barely vibrating. It must be asleep. Harvey watched the animal for several minutes. A faint blue breeze sighed through the parapets of the palace mounting above him. Below, in the courtyard, he heard the stealthy rattle of chains. Ghosts? His mind rejected the possibility at once. He had never believed in them before. Why start now? His mind worked furiously as the sound halted. Bridge. Drawbridge. He recalled seeing a drawbridge across the moat when Dana had led him swimming yesterday, only they had entered through a small door set flush with the surface of the water. Someone must be letting the drawbridge down, and it had to be Dana. Harvey raised up on his elbow and carefully put a foot over the edge of the cot. He crept to the railing of the balcony and looked down eighty feet of blue emptiness to the yellowness of the hill. Down it, a cloaked figure followed a crooked path to the edge of the world. Dana. 
Something sparked an irrational fear in Harvey as the figure grew smaller with distance. He wrapped his robe about him, slipped into his flight shoes. There was something to examine later. Where had he gotten those words? And dodged into a hallway. All roads led to the courtyard, Harvey knew. At least, all that he had covered. He cast an apprehensive glance over his shoulder to see if the changeling had followed him then wondered at his apprehension. His memory of existence went back less than twenty-four hours, and this bothered him. He should have thought more about what the ship was, rather than where he was, he thought self-deprecatingly. But Dana had to be going somewhere, and in this world, bounded so tightly by infinity, there was nothing left to do but wonder where the hell she was going. He halted in the courtyard, located the path to the drawbridge, and found the drawbridge closed. Yip, Harvey thought. Either Dana was already back, or she had someone, or something, here to draw the bridge up after her departure. He whirled, saw nothing, and ran back to the garden, retracing their steps of yesterday to the small door unhinging out onto the moat. He stripped down to his trunks and slid out into the chill purple of the water. It became immediately obvious that swimming was not a nighttime sport. The water was extremely cold. Harvey twice bumped into floating cakes of ice, and harboured a species of life that, while seemingly harmless, certainly felt horrible. He pulled himself out on the far side and sat chattering for several minutes, massaging his legs. Somewhere on that small plain of grass, Dear old Dana was up to something, and Harvey felt it imperative that he know what. He shuddered to his feet and gaped back at the castle. In the crazy lights of the whirling moons, shadows danced and played in the deep gouges of balconies and alcoves. The ramparts themselves stabbed into the night sky like the many-pointed noses of rockets on the space field. Space field? Rockets? What? A dim wave of remembrance washed over Harvey. He clenched his fists and tried to think. He tore at the black veil over the past with mental fingers, and it resisted. He opened his eyes and found himself running down the esplanade toward the spot where he had regained consciousness the day before. He slowed to a walk, hoping the crazily darting, heterochromatic moons would hide his mobile shadow among the moving shadows of the fixed plants and rocks. Near the place where he had first met her, Dana halted and looked behind her. Harvey darted into the dubious shelter of a triangle tree and stopped, waiting breathlessly for her call of discovery. Nothing happened, and a few moments later he chanced to look. A row of three eyes stared coldly in his face. Harvey jerked back, shuddered to fight back a yell, and ran madly down the hill toward Dana, but she was no longer in sight. For one wild second, Harvey thought she had disappeared over the edge. A look confirmed the fallacy of the notion, but behind him the three floating red eyes stared impassively. Angrily he wrenched them from the air and flung the glowing coals out into infinity, and had the satisfaction of watching them dwindle into nothing. He had no idea what they were. All he knew was he hadn't liked them. Disappointed at having lost Dana, he started back up the hill toward the castle. Thud! Harvey picked himself up off the ground and explored the night air in front of him with wary hands. He encountered solid surface and felt his way around it, astonished. It was the ship. Dana had done nothing but render it invisible yesterday. He located the rocket tubes and the heavy arches of the landing fins, and looked up when he judged he should be under the airlock. A sudden frightful flood of memory poured over him. My God! Earth! The universe! Me! Harvey? Silence. He squatted down under the rocket's firing flange, hidden from view of the airlock. Harvey, dear, is that you? 
A light sprang out of the air twenty feet above the ground. Dana stood in breathtaking silhouette in a rectangular frame of familiar white. Harvey realised it was the first time since... since the crash. Since the crash that he had seen white light. White, the symbol of truth. He straightened, still under the flange, and waited while Dana decided to come down and look around. He would soon get the truth. Harvey? He tensed as her shapely legs appeared, carefully feeling for the rungs of an invisible ladder. When she reached the ground, Harvey stepped around the exhaust flange and flung himself on her. They landed in the yellow turf, and Harvey found without surprise he faced a formidable opponent. Whatever the force that had enabled her to lift the ship yesterday proved equally useful against flesh, but Harvey found he also possessed new strength. His eyes fell on the tiny metal case strapped to her waist. A matter disorganizer! Harvey! Stop it, Harvey! You don't know what you're doing! she screamed. He laughed harshly and finally succeeded in wrenching the little metal box away from her. "'You are going to destroy the ship!' he shouted incredulously. "'In God's name, why?' She stepped back from him, tears glistening in her eyes. "'To keep this from happening!' she panted. She turned and yelled something at the castle. In the weird moonlights, a huge flying monster dragged itself from the topmost pinnacle and came in a banshee wail toward Harvey. He put down his fear and aimed the matter disorganizer carefully. The huge yawning mouth gaped out at him as he pulled the actuator. The banshee's scream stopped abruptly. The monster vanished. Dana fell to her knees, sobbing. You've killed him! You've killed Timothy! she cried. Harvey turned back to the ridiculous rectangle of white radiance suspending in mid-air and adjusted the MD's energy span. The solid metal walls of the rocket reared into the night sky. "'All right, Dana,' Harvey said coldly, turning to the kneeling woman. "'Where am I, and what's going on here?' "'I—I I suppose I should tell you now,' she choked out, standing without his help. Harvey felt suddenly cold. The night wind had ceased, and a blue heatlessness settled over the yellow field. Even the moons had lost some of their giddy fervour. "'Go on, I'm listening.' He felt his voice soften and rebelled. He had been subservient for too long in this crazy world, he realised. He felt something else was necessary. "'I remember now,' he stated." Dana sucked in her breath and stared at him longingly. "'Oh, Harvey, darling, I've lost you so many times already. Must we go through it again?' she said sadly. Harvey said nothing. Her shoulders sagged. "'Very well. It isn't a long story. You remember Earth, Harvey? Your Earth?' "'I remember.' "'You know why you came here?' "'No.' Look at your ship, Harvey. It's old. It is very old. I'm going to tell you something, something you already know, but won't admit to yourself. A frightened look appeared in Harvey's eyes. Well, go on, tell me, he shouted impatiently, fearfully. After your ship left Earth, Harvey, it jumped the light barrier. But you and the others hadn't counted on the forces involved. Everything but the man was designed to take that jump. You never came out of overdrive, Harvey. You're still in that ship, and you'll never wake up. She laughed, cried at Harvey's twisted face. You're crazy, he roared hoarsely. You're crazy. I remember. I know where I am and how to get back. Take a look around you, Harvey Crane. Dana laughed at him hysterically. Do you think a world such as this could ever really exist? All this, Harvey, she gestured at the chunk of land, the castle and the moons. They're just symbols. This island, your mind, 
The world edge is the end of reality. Out there, the moons, they are insanity. But you wanted me to stay here. Why did you change your mind? He stared at her accusingly. If you wish, you can ascribe motives to my actions, Dana said tiredly. But they are your motives, not mine, Harvey. I'm just real in your imagination. In reality, the only reality, I'm back on earth, waiting, Harvey. Go back. I want you so. Harvey stared at her, incredulous. But you, who are you? he blurted. She bit her lip and gazed at him sadly. I, she said, her voice tremulent, am your wife. Harvey's memory tore back to a green planet called Earth. Forgotten faces, places. He looked at Dana for the first time, and in that instant of full recognition, she began to dissolve. Harvey, she pleaded, wake up. You've got to face reality before it's too late. Please! She sobbed into non-existence. Harvey wheeled toward the ship and fled up the ramp. No, no, this is reality, he shouted. He stared up at the insane island moons swirling in the sky, the soft, sourceless aqua of the air, the incredible bulk of the castle on the edge of infinity, and he felt on the brink of hell. Something was going to happen. Harvey's breathing was loud in the thundering silence. The castle suddenly wrenched from the island and lifted ponderously into the air, an immense ghastly shadow looming closer. Harvey screamed. He spun around, intending to use the matter disorganizer on the castle as it swung faster and faster toward the ship. The MD slipped from his grasp, and sailed high into the air toward the No! No! Up and up! No! No! Up and up! No! Please, Harvey, you're trapped in your, in your imagination. You've got to face reality! Clank! It hit the ship. The universe dissolved in a vivid flash of white fire and still Harvey could hear Dana's whispered pleading. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Touch the Sky by Alfred Koppel Originally published in Startling Stories, Summer 1955 Narrated by Tom Trisser. The sign said, Ride the rocket twice around the universe for 25 cents, which was cheap enough, Pete Moore thought, cheap enough at twice the fare. Glory giggled and pulled at his arm. Let's ride, Pete. Let's see what you're in for. He smiled down at her thinly, because it wasn't really anything for her to giggle about, but that was glory for you. She was young enough, gay enough, to be able to make a joke of it. And that was good, and it shouldn't spoil it. Not many other wives would feel like that. Not many other wives would want to spend his last night home on the midway, for that matter. But then again, that was glory. He listened to the tinny carousel music and the babble of the crowd, the laughter and the mingled drone of barkers. He smelled the tang of roasting popcorn and the hot doggy stink of the lunch counters. He looked at the ferris wheel and the crazy swoop of lights that was the scenic railway and the people crowding along the boardwalk with cupid dolls and spun sugar candy cones in their hands. Question, his mind demanded, is this reality? Answer, of course, what else? I've been too long away from cities, he thought. Too many silent nights in the desert. Too many high flights in cold blue air. Too long away from glory. He felt guilty and depressed at the thought. It wasn't the way for a man to feel. Not before the great adventure. Still, he couldn't avoid an almost homesick longing for the deep darkness of the desert and the silver ship waiting there. 
Soon, he thought. Three days. Three days and a few hours. He felt a tug at his arms. Pete! Gloria was smiling up at him, half aggrieved, half loving. He looked again at the garishly painted sign. Ride the rocket! Let's ride it, Pete, Gloria said. Let's! There was something in her smile that touched him. Pride? That, and love, and youth. To her, he was the man. For her, and for all the world. The one who was going to reach out beyond the far horizon, and touch the sky, and bring back a pot of gold for everyone. She thinks no one else could do it, he told himself. That's love. There were a dozen qualified men, and yet the moonshot was his. Ride the rocket! All right, baby, he said. As he paid the fare for the rocket ride, Pete found himself looking at the girl in the booth. Tired eyes and stringy hennaed hair. No dreams there. He had an impulse to tell her that soon he'd really be riding the rocket, and that from then on things would be different. New frontiers and new dreams for everybody. Up and up! The girl's eyes met his, and it was Pete who looked away. You don't talk frontiers to pale, worn faces and eyes bleached of colour by tinny music and stinks and men. They walked up a wooden ramp to where the little metal bullet on rails waited. The paint, once bright, was all scuffy. A sour-faced attendant in greyish coveralls stood by a large lever. Fasten your seat belts, Mac. We're off to the sky, Glory said. Somewhere old machinery wheezed. The little bullets began to move along the rails toward a hinged trapdoor in the wall painted to look like clouds. Hold my hand, Pete, Glory said breathlessly. Glory, glory, he thought, young and simple and in love with life. Any kind of life, real or unreal. Glory with a bubbling laughter, a zest, a faith. Maybe it was really for her that he was taking the big flight. If only he could bring back the pot of gold. If only he could tell weary man that the sky was all his. He thought of the strained, unhappy faces in the streets, the fear-filled eyes. If he could return and say to them, Here's your new frontier! Yes, by God, it was worth the work and the risk. Glory was right. It was something to be proud of. I'm going to the moon. Me, Pete Moore, to the moon. There it is, Pete. They had bumped through the painted door into a musty semi-darkness. The walls were perforated with holes for stars, and from somewhere below a huge yellowish moon was rising. Off a short way to the right was a glowing papier-mâché globe, painted with broad bands slightly askew and behind that was another with rings. A loudspeaker whistled tinnily and overhead, on wire runners, an electric globe crossed the dim chamber, pieces of yellow and white crepe paper fluttering feebly behind. Oh, Peter Comet! Sure enough, Glory, he said. The rumbling little bullets skirted the walls, and Pete could see the electric lights behind the holes. Stars, he thought sardonically. Close enough to touch. Lucky us. There's Mars, Pete, Glory said, squeezing his hand. I'm getting disenchanted, he thought. A red ball, all painted with canals and white polar caps, far too big. They should have had a technical adviser on this project, he thought. Paging Palomar. The bullet began its second circuit of the papier-mâché universe, and the moon was high now projected on the wall by some kind of lantern slide lamp. There was a face on the moon. It began, then, just a tiny bead of fear way down inside his belly. But it grew. He felt suffocated, claustrophobic, oppressed by fakery and cheapness. Glory was laughing with delight. Oh, it's wonderful! Shut up! 
Pete thought savagely. Shut up, shut up! With an effort, he got hold of himself. I've been working too hard. I'm jittery thinking about the moonshot, and all this seedy burlesque just irritates me. There's nothing to get heated up about. Calm down. But why am I suddenly afraid? He looked again at the ridiculous moon with its smirking face. He saw that plaster had fallen from the wall in places, peeling away, leaving the bare hexagons of wire and lathes. My God, he thought, a chicken wire sky. He thought again of the girl in the ticket booth, and of the tired, frightened people all laughing too much and shoving and running outside. The bullet started down at last toward the hinged door. On this side it was painted to look like earth, with a distorted map of North America, all wrong somehow. Pete felt ill. It was as though someone were making ill-tempered fun of the dreams and the tall silver ship waiting out on the desert, cheapening it, laughing nastily. The little bullet bumped through the seedy, scruffy earth and out into the night of the midway, out into the crowd sounds and music and hot doggy smells. "'It was fun, Pete,' Glory said. He helped her out onto the rickety platform. He had the insane notion that the girl in the ticket booth and the lounging attendant were laughing at him. "'It sure was, honey,' he said wearily, still feeling the illogical fear of he knew not what inside himself. "'Real fun!' Glory looked up at him, eyes alight and almost feverishly gay. "'I did what you were going to do. I touched the sky.' "'New frontiers, new lands in the sky, new hope.' It was quiet. The jet was still and no sound was anywhere in the ship. Now a soft tick from the timer, a whisper from the questing radar scope, and again the stillness. We've done it, Pete thought. We've really done it. The hard part's over. Ride the rocket. He remembered the pain of the take-off and the absolute panic that had welled up in him when the irrevocability of his action came home. He remembered riding a tail of red fire up out of the hot desert air of New Mexico into the still blue, and then the silence and the almost unnerving thrill of the realization of the moonshot was going to succeed. The radio hissed at him with the voice of the desert base half around the world. Hello, moonshot. This is base. All's OK. Stage one landed in the gulf. Stage two just reported floating off the Azores. Good show. Pete lifted himself from the acceleration couch and felt a moment of nausea and panic as he floated toward the ceiling of the tiny cell. Free flight. He steadied himself and checked the flow of telemetered information binding the ship to the glowing curve far below. All okay, except that... Except that you're still afraid, he told himself. Not just the normal fear of falling afraid that the Sykes told you about. Afraid like before, in that silly damned carnival ride thing. Afraid of the dark? No, not quite that. More a closed-in, cheated feeling. Premonition? Nonsense. He clung to the radar scope, trembling. With every rushing mile upward, outward, his fear was growing. It wasn't right. It didn't make sense. But it felt as though he was rushing straight at a brick wall, head down, eyes closed. He lit the telescreens. The stars look funny, he thought uneasily. The timer ticked. The radar whispered, searching. Time passed and his fear grew thicker, less reasonable. His fingers dug hard at the metal of the instrument panel as the night slipped by outside the hull. The ship's orbital ellipse, Kepler's contribution to the new frontier, was established. Pete thought, something's wrong, very wrong. The stars look queer. 
The constellations in the telescreens were distorting, and there was something ahead of the ship where there should be nothing but emptiness. It showed in the screen for just an instant and was lost. A ringed sphere. I must be dreaming, Pete thought. But then, what is reality? That sphere was Saturn, and it was a hundred yards across. Reality? Insanity! I'd better check with the base, Pete thought, and tell them I've gone off my rocker, that I'm suffering hallucinations. But he did nothing, except cling shaking to the panel, watching the distorted stars in the screen. They were blurring now, streaks of light that seemed to be very close to the ship. And then came the moon. It came and went very quickly, pocked and scarred with only one face, and small, very small and very close. Pete felt closed in, suffocated. The radar alarm was screaming at him that something was near, too near. He clamped down savagely on himself. There was an explanation somewhere. He had to find it. He had to think. Item. The stars. Distorted. Blurred. Item. Saturn. A hundred yards across. Item. A tiny replica of the moon, like a pimple on the inside of an egg. Replica? No. The moon. The only moon. Reality. Hypothesis. Say that space is not as men imagined it. Say that it is an illusion, without light years, without great suns, without huge planets. Say for the sake of argument that it is a shell with holes in it, and light outside, and the sun itself an illusion of heat and power, and say that this hollow shell is man's new frontier, a fraud, a toy for things outside. The alarm screamed at him. The ship was plunging toward the blurry light of the stars. With an icy hand on his heart, Pete Moore turned to look at the telescreen behind him. A misty blue ball swam in musty darkness. The oceans gleamed in the light of the sun. Cloud masses whitened it. The wrinkled face of the land looked unreal. He began to laugh. Tears streaked his cheek as he pounded his bloody fist against the instrument panel in time to the clanging of the alarm. The earth. The earth. It did rather look like papier-mâché. He touched the sky. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. From the pages of dusty old pulp magazines to your ear.